Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Austin B Media Podcast for the second episode of this week. I'm sure you're as surprised as uh, I am. After my discussion with Ann Stuckey uh, yesterday, I was like, let me save myself the hassle of having to edit all this week's podcast discussions into one big, long episode. Because for those who haven't listened to it yet, that El Conde discussion was like 58 minutes. So I, I don't feel like people would watch three of them. So I decided to piecemeal these out. And what we're talking about today is Elemental with Sebastian Zavala, who I know primarily through our work at IFSC. Let me see yeah. if I get it right. International Film Society Critics. I think that's where we met, right? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. What do you got going on? Plug some of your work. Well, yeah, thank you for inviting me. For, of course. Uh, yeah, just to begin with, I'm really excited to be here. I did see this film, what, two months ago, more or less, when it was first released in theaters or, in, or, or at the cinema. I know that it, right now it's on Disney+, Plus, so I managed to see a little bit of it. But what I remember the most is like my visceral reaction, like the the, the, the first impression I had when I see it, saw it at the cinema, which was very positive, to be fair. I enjoyed it quite a bit. And that's interesting considering it, it came with not a lot of hype, especially considering it's a Pixar film. A lot of talk about yeah. how it was being like a box office bomb and it had million reviews in Cannes and everything like that. So I guess my expectations weren't that high, but I had a good time with it. Yeah. Yeah. So let's lead with that, but with our experiences with the movie because i think we had two different experiences Ooh. because i didn't see it until a few weeks ago when it came whenever it came out on digital that's when i saw it that weekend and i hadn't seen it in the theaters because i, I don't know about you but i don't like seeing animated quote-unquote kids movies i, I say quote-unquote because More like family I, films yeah family-oriented films in theaters because I'm like I I get so stressed about what the kids are going to do that I'm like let me just enjoy it in the peace of my home I can pause I can grab popcorn or not popcorn snacks I can watch it in my robe whatever you expect but so I watched it that way yeah that's and, interesting and thanks to Disney for that they keep sending me those movies and I'm like oh thank you <laughs> but but yeah so there's that and then Let's talk about the box office thing, because I don't know if it, it, it was an interesting time, because when did it come out? Around the time The Flash, right around there? Yeah, it was about June, because all the talk about the box office was around The Flash, Indiana Jones, and of course, Elemental, which were like the big three box office bombs of the summer, of the North Hemisphere summer. But yeah, so it was weird, because what I the impression I had is that nobody thought that the whole Barbenheimer thing was going to be so big. So they just released all these films very close to both Barbie and Oppenheimer. And nobody thought that they were going to be, end up being eclipsed by those two films. Yeah, I liked Indiana Jones, but of course it was, it didn't do very well in the, at the box office. Elementally, eventually they did much better through word of mouth and stuff like that. And The Flash, that, that film lost like $200 million to, for, for Warner Brothers. So yeah, it didn't do well. <laughs> Yeah, and now it's ended up in like the top five. And what's interesting about that, I think, for the box office discussion, to be quite frank, I'm growing tired of. I saw an article last, a headline last night of, oh, I forget what movie it was. Like, oh, it was Taylor Swift Heiress Tour. It was like, oh, yeah, the concert yeah, film. It was like Taylor Swift the Heiress Tour might save movie theaters this fall. And I'm getting real sick of that headline. I don't know about you. Yeah, we should be focusing more on the films in themselves. Yeah. All the money talk in the end is a little bit secondary. And I think like people, they depend too much on first impressions or like the first weekend for the box office impressions because everybody was saying, for example, that Elemental was going to be a flop, but then it did so well throughout the weeks that in the end it wasn't a flop. So they definitely uh, were in a rush to condemn it, basically, which I don't like. You know? Yeah, I definitely saw that a lot from Variety, I, I think it was. Mm -hmm. um, and the weirder aspect of their box office campaign, at least from the Pixar side of it, was, I don't know if you saw this, the TikTok campaign, the little mm -hmm. TikTok video they released. And I'll link it in the show notes so everyone can see this monstrosity. 
if it's still up, I'm assuming it's still up. They, I'm assuming it's faked. It has to be faked because that would be stranger than anything. They faked like recording the movie. One of the characters, the audience was going crazy over Claude and they tried to make Claude a big thing to drive people to the theaters. And I was like, this is the weirdest box office campaign I think I've seen in a while. <laughs> yeah, I think I saw that. It was cringe. It, I had the feeling that it was trying to appeal to the Zoomers. And like, yeah. it was clearly done by someone who's much older. Like, a, like an older person trying to think like a younger person, but they didn't just, they, they, they don't know how to do that. So yeah, it was cringe, basically. It, it, it didn't work. <laughs> it doesn't work. Yeah, it it definitely reeked of the how do you do fellow kids meme. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, Because it had the TikTok text to speech voice and everything. It was like, oh my goodness, what are you doing? Pixar, you make good movies. You don't have to do this. Yeah, there's no need at all. (laughs) And there was no need because the word of mouth was basically what saved the, the film. So yeah. Yeah, because I don't think I saw any campaign, so to speak, after that. Um, no, from, me neither. Yeah, I feel like they did the Disney marketing machine, whatever you want to call it, just let it go. No pun intended. But yeah, it, it was weird. But but I want to talk about, let's see, th- this movie was a pleasant surprise given that, that all I had heard from it. Yeah. Because I think part of me wanted to, I don't know, believe that it was a bad movie. Because everyone was saying it was a lot and that it was such an apparent cash grab and realistic. I mean, to be fair, it was mainly the French who were saying that it was bad. <laughs> fair. And I was watching a lot of YouTube around that time where yeah. I was looking at what people were saying about elemental. So I may have dived a little too deep in that whole rabbit hole. Yeah. So when I watched it on digital, uh, mm-hmm. it, it, it was a pleasant surprise. I'll be honest, I'll call spade a spade. It does story-wise feel a little bit analogous to Inside Out and Zootopia. So yeah, yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Especially with some of its themes. And that those parts I didn't I was not really vibing with, but I really I really liked what it did with it. So I thought the animation was stellar. I, I, oh, it was gorgeous. Yeah. You can see cre- cre- clearly see the 200 million dollars they invested because yeah, it looks amazing. And yeah, I think the like on a narrative standpoint, it works more emotionally than in terms of like originality, because it mm-hmm. does feel a little bit like other films. But I think it works because of the way they present the characters and the relationship when the, the whole thing about family and the way he, he she wants to be accepted and he wants to be ac- accepted. And there's a reason why a lot of people end up crying with the film. It's it doesn't feel manipulative. I think it's just, it's basically an allegory for immigrants and the life experiences of the director. And, and I think in that way, it works. It feels, it doesn't feel cynical. And I, I like that honesty, to be fair. Yeah. And on the Pixar cry meter, it's up there with Toy <laughs> yeah, Story 3. I cried three or four times in this movie. But I think that, that comes out of the emotional honesty that Peter saw in, which Reminder, this is his first film. He's done Pixar shorts and he was involved with Lightyear. But this is his first first feature. Yeah, Yeah. it's his directorial debut, which is surprising. And to be honest, I actually forgot that he didn't direct Lightyear. I saw in the back of my mind, like while while watching the movie, I was like, didn't he just direct Lightyear? But no, he he played the cats, the robot cats. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. I know because I watched it like three times because I watched the digital copy, the uh, oh. Disney Plus copy because they had an IMAX on that. Oh, um, nice. Yeah, th- that was really nice. But yeah. But yeah, let's see. Um, but yeah, as a feature debut, this is amazing. Yeah, if it were my my first film, I would be really proud of it. I wouldn't have any complaints, to be fair. Especially because emotions that I think is the classic Pixar formula in that Kids can enjoy it because of the action and the colors and the world building and the jokes and everything. But then older people can see the the real life allegories and be like, okay, I, I get this. I understand the the conflicts, the internal conflicts of the characters, and I understand 
what they want and what they need and the way they end up better by the end of the film with their families and, and everything. So yeah, it, it, it works on, on both levels, which not most Pixar films work on those two levels. Not all of them. You mentioned Lightyear. I thought the film was fine, but it was, yeah, at least for me, it didn't work like yeah. on the more mature level. It worked as a, as a fun adventure or whatever, but that was it. So I think for me, this is an improvement over Lightyear, definitely. Oh, by far. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and I, I liked Lightyear, just, but yeah. that is my Toy Story fandom coloring it. Definitely. Um, yeah. Because. Because I'm still, I, I don't mean to talk so, too much about Lightyear, but I feel like it's almost relevant given Peter Song's direct connection to it and it being the more, I think, that was the one before Elemental, right? That was the last one? Yeah, last film? So because, because post-pandemic, during the pandemic, we had Soul, then we had Luca, then we had uh, Turning Red, then we had Lightyear, and then we have this one. I think there's nothing else, I think. There's, I think the next one is Elio or something oh, like yeah, that. Oh, yeah, the new one. The one yeah. that's coming, yeah. But yeah, the only knock I have against Lightyear was it wasn't emotionally honest like a, a Pixar movie is. Yeah. And this is, uh, circling back around to Elemental, this movie is emotionally honest and it really tries to... It, it tries to see look at the whole picture of why are these two people so different in their upbringing? Why are these things happening? And it really goes, it really does some cool stuff with the elements too, with how they interact. So it uh, mar marks off that animation box, but that's why I talked about Inside Out and Zootopia is because those two movies were really good at displaying the emotional intelligence that it wanted the audience to have. Yeah, where Inside Out was a very movie about tragedy that if you were a kid you could get, but like you needed it explained. Whereas here it's like right up in your face and hey, you're gonna have to talk to your kid after this. But but it's smarter about that, like Zootopia was, where it's not entirely trying to evoke an emotion out of you it's just trying to say hey, here's what's happened make your own um have your own discussions after the movie yeah it also helps that it it may help kids that may not know a lot about that, that subject in particular to understand how immigrants may feel or the way especially countries like america and other countries of course they have people from all around the world from different backgrounds different colors different countries and origins and the way we all have different experiences, but we all, we also have to live with, with each other and be acceptant of people who are different, which I think is a very valuable and nice message to have on a film like this. Yeah, and uh, I think a prime example of it was, I think, I don't want to give too much away, but there's a moment about a bow. <laughs> uh, listeners, wa watchers, you'll know it when it happens because it'll rip your heart out. Yeah, uh, but it communicates something so efficiently where it's where to a kid, I think at the base level, it registers as, oh, this is a really big moment and really ties in that um, goes for, for full circle. Can't talk today with the um, allegory about immigration and the effects it has um, on future generations. Yeah, and you improved you this, the, the way. We may have, like, we, we some, sometimes we can make up our minds about other people just by seeing them or by what other people t tell us about them. But then when we get to know these people, we're like, oh, yeah, it's fine. Why are people so prejudiced? Yeah, I do think all the messages are really well made. And it does feel, it's not subtle, but I didn't mind that it wasn't subtle. I think, like, I will say that one of Disney's biggest mistakes this year was to screen both Indiana Jones and Elemental in Cannes. It was yeah. a wrong crowd. I mean, I don't think it did, did those films any favors. And maybe they were expecting something more soulful or more subtle. And it's not, but it doesn't have to be. It's not trying to be. So for me, it was fine. It felt, it didn't feel, it didn't feel over the top or anything like that. It was cool. Yeah. If you want my thing about that, about Can, because yeah. they also, I think, was Can the same time as Tribeca? 
I think it was close, but it's not exactly at the same time, I don't think. Yeah, so I, I would have held Elemental for Tribeca because it almost feels like New York in a way, yeah. the way this Elemental City is laid out. And yeah, yeah, yeah. anyone who's read my coverage knows Tribeca 2023 was filled with New York allegories, absolutely filled. <laughs> but But my old read on that was they, I think Disney's stratagem with that was, oh, can we think these two movies are going to be our two big movies that we campaign for? Yeah. And this is going to be the start of our awards campaigning. Yeah, it was a miscalculation, definitely. And I hope they learned a lesson because I don't think there was any need to have those, those two films in a festival. It's weird. They were out of competition and everything, which is, which makes sense. But still, I don't know. And it was like they premiered them in those festivals like too far away from their actual release dates because the reception mm -hmm. wasn't that great. It was like one or two months of whatever the opposite is of hype. Hype pretty much died down because of the those releases. So, yeah. Yeah, if I had to give Disney any pointers about anything they put out in June, just send it to Tribeca. Yeah. It's also an award, an Oscar eligible festival and people will go out and view the gala films even if they, they're not even interested in it so you'd probably get even more hype or or whatever you're wanting to do and it would have been closer to elemental and indiana jones release dates although i think indiana jones 5 takes place in is that new york or san francisco i think it's new york at least at the beginning when he is okay so you got two new york films but Put it in the New there York you. Festival or <laughs> New York you. Film Festival. Just delay yeah. him three months. But yeah. And I, speaking of Elemental City, I really loved how that was laid out. If I hadn't said that already, it felt like a real city, much more so in the way, and here's where the Zootopia comparison comes in, much more real than the Zootopia did. Because Zootopia very much felt like once you got on that tram, it was like, oh, here's these sectioned out places where all hmm. this certain species lives. And I was like, okay, I guess that makes sense, but not really. But in this one, it's, oh, no, these this element would need to live here because of these reasons. And they do a really yeah, good think, job. I think of, it's about, just like more consistent world building, probably. And it makes, yeah. it has more of an internal logic, I would say. And I think that's why it, it works better. Yeah, because they, Peter Son, and I hope I'm pronouncing that. Um, I think it is, yeah. Yeah, I think so. I hope so. He, he, no, you're good. He takes great, takes a lot of time towards the beginning saying, hey, here's why Ember and her family live right here. Yeah. Here's why Wade lives right here. Here's his background and everything. So I've, I, that was much appreciated for me. And then I guess, what did you think of Leah Lewis? And I can't pronounce his name, Mamadou Athi? Yeah, 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 I think so. Yeah, I think they were both great. I did believe in their characters. My only point of reference for Leah Lewis was this Netflix film she made during the pandemic that got released during the pandemic, which is uh, called half of it. The Half of It, which I thought was pretty good. I enjoyed great that movie. one when I saw it back in 2020. I, I think she did a great job in there. And yeah, I, the advantage of getting... Not unknowns because they're not unknowns, but people who are not like super, super famous is that they can get lost in the characters and then you just start hearing the characters and not a famous actor or whatever, which is sometimes a problem that the that DreamWorks films have because they like using celebrities. And sometimes those voices are a little bit too well known. So you keep imagining the celebrity instead of believing in the character. But in this case, yeah, because I'm not too familiar with their voices. I think they both did a, a great job. And in terms of characterization, I did I liked a lot what they did, did with Wade. The, the fact that they that he belongs to this family that's not afraid of showing emotion. And they actually are very emotional and they cry when they feel like crying and they're super happy when they feel like they have to be happy and stuff like that. And it was like, that's actually a very good, I don't know, lesson, but maybe reference for kids that there's nothing wrong, especially when you're a guy, because sexism and, and some preconceptions we have, sometimes men, men are not expected to be emotional. But yeah. what this film is saying is, if you're a guy, or you or if you're whatever, there's nothing wrong with being emotional. It's actually pretty healthy. And that's another thing that I liked a lot about the film, because it's not, I don't think it's something that I've seen a lot 
in family films. It's it felt very contemporary and very I don't know. It felt nice to see in a film like this. And I like the differences between them. You felt that they he was teaching her stuff, she was teaching him stuff about their their own cultures and their customs and everything. And yeah, it was cool. And then I think we also have the the parents, the family. And I, I don't think there's anybody else that's super famous. I think they just picked the right people and the right actors for the roles. They didn't depend on cele celebrity names or anything. So that was cool. Yeah. And I, and I think it goes back to, you know, what you're talking about with uh, celebrities where you hear their name, hear their name, and then you associate, oh, this is what they're supposed to sound like. Um, because I don't, I can't remember a time where Pixar really did a unknown or quote unquote unknown actor or actress for one of their voice roles. Yeah, maybe Luca because they're kids. Maybe I think that'd be maybe the closest one. But yeah, yeah. so Jimmy Fox, Turning Red has. I think Turning Red is the closest we yeah. get. Yeah, maybe. Yeah. But they're never on the same level as DreamWorks, who we'll just love their celebrities. <laughs> yeah, where you're watching Push and Puss in Boots, The Last Wish, and you're like, oh, Antonio Banderas. Oh, Salma Hayek. Oh, Florence Tom Pugh. Mulaney. Yeah. yeah. Oh, who is that? Florence Pugh. She, she oh, played, yeah. Uh, oh, that. Oh, don't even remind me of that storyline. I can't. <laughs> I like the film a lot, but yeah. It's a different style, which is fine. They prefer the celebrities, Pixar doesn't, and they work in different styles, different ways. But I think in this story in particular, I appreciated the fact that they just got the best people for the job, and that's it, and it works. Yeah, same. And then keying in on that second half, I do think we are starting to see that healthy representation of emotions now. You're talking about being comfortable with emotions as men and it reminds me i don't know if you're watching this show strange planet on apple tv plus mm -hmm. i think it was a comic series by nathan pyle and they turned it into a tv show with H hannah einbinder danny pudi and a bunch of really big names or at least big names that i would know yeah, of course <laughs> yeah they made it for me right but they have a episode in which they these two best friends break up and, and oh no I'm, I'm remembering a netflix movie oh. it was the adam sandler movie you're not, not so not invited to my bar mitzvah where... i have not seen that one yet but i've heard really good things about it so maybe i shouldn't spoil this but th <laughs> there's a display where these two girls have a game of trying to see who cries first mm -hmm. and wade's I think it was the exact same thing is saying phrases to see who cries first or cries the most. I think that's what it was. And it just reminded me of that. But yeah, I think, yeah, like you said, I, I totally agree. I think we are of the same opinion of just about everything on this movie, I think, because I think with a movie like this, you are you need to be atta attached way more to the characters and broad eagle eye view of what the story is trying to do rather than, oh, hey, what's going on right now, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. Yeah, I know what you mean. Like the big picture, basically. Yeah, because to use, I'm going to use an inside out reference again, <laughs> maybe because I just don't like that movie. Sorry, internet, but oh, you um, don't. That's interesting. I, I, I don't. It is, it is the other end of Pixar's emotional honesty, where I feel like it's emotionally manipulative. Interesting. I, it, we I haven't seen it in years, so maybe I did like it when I saw it for the first time. But who knows? Maybe if I do it right now, I might think the same as you. We'll see. But yeah. Oh, sorry. Go on. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah, my comparison was basically just that. In Inside Out, you're very much, okay, we need to get to this objective, and this is what we're doing. But this is much more, okay, what's Ember experiencing? What are the emotions she's feeling? What's happening over here with Wade? It, it, especially with, oh, there's, I don't want to give that away. But there's like a critical thing that happens towards the end of the movie where it's, oh, there's the metaphor and you finally it finally clicks for you and then you start to realize oh hey it's not about 
the uh, this is going to be so cheesy, but I'm just going to say the quote anyway. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Um, and that's how I really feel about it. And so, yeah, I I really feel like, yeah, Elemental is really great, um, which I yeah. didn't expect to say six months ago. Yeah, like I said, I think they, they released it in the wrong way. And I do agree that the destination, sorry, that the journey is more important than the destination, especially because in this case, and without revealing anything about the ending, that the journey is what actually makes the, the destination worth it. Yeah. And the way the film ends, you get the sense that they're just, we're seeing like the beginning of their lives. They have a lot of more things to experience in their lives, which is nice. It doesn't end with a sequel bait or anything like that. And I don't think it's going to get a sequel. I don't think so. Um, I, I I disagree there. I definitely felt baited uh, of a potential Disney Plus series. Oh, well, maybe. I mean, maybe because it, did, it, did, it didn't do that that bad. They could do a series instead of a film. That, that would work. I would see it. That would be cool. Why not? Yeah. But yeah, I, I definitely thought, yeah, it, it, it's just one, it's really unique. And I want to talk really quick about, we were talking about how it was released. And yeah. I think going backwards to our initial discussion about how it performed, I, do you think th- this being the first non Disney Plus film for Pixar? Heard it. Yeah, I think there's there was this sense that people were getting used to getting Pixar films directly on Disney Plus, which was understandable during the pandemic, but they definitely made a mistake with that, especially with Turning Red. I think the oh, one I would have loved to most, see that in theaters. Yeah, it would have been amazing. And I think the film that suffered the most because of that was Lightyear, obviously. Because of Buzz Lightyear, how the hell did that end up being a flop? That makes no sense. It does make sense right right now, but it didn't make sense when, when it got released. I think People are just starting to get used to the fact that Pixar is going back to cinemas, I think. And I think maybe they weren't used to it in the beginning. That's why they didn't do that well in the first weekend. But because then the word of mouth was so strong, they were like, okay, maybe this one is worth going out of the house for. That's why it ended up grossing more than 500 million. So yeah, I think we're like in a, we're in the middle of the process of people getting used to the fact that they have to see these films in the cinema again. We just, we're, we're, yeah, we're finishing with that period of having Pixar at home. We can have Pixar at home and maybe later, but if you really want to see this film, you're going to go to the cinema, which I think is better for the films. Like you just said, turning red at the cinema, I would have loved to see that one in there. And I think it w- would have worked because it's another demographic and everything. But yeah, I think it hurt this one a little bit, maybe in the short term, but not so much in the long term, thankfully. But it definitely hurt Buzz Lightyear or Lightyear because, yeah, that one. I don't think it would have done super well in other circumstances because I don't think the word of mouth would have been that good. But definitely not as badly as it did last year because it did really bad. <laughs> okay. Since we're already talking about Lightyear. Yeah. I, I, can I go on a Toy Story tangent? Because we're talking about why we think um, Lightyear did so bad. And I really have. I'm of the opinion, so I've watched every Toy Story, everything, like the shorts, everything. The special um, ones. Yeah, even the ones you can't get anymore. So I grew up with Buzz Lightyear of Star Command, The Adventure Begins. Mm, the show, So, yeah. Yes, oh, and the movie, because it came out on VHS. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah, they had a TV movie, yeah. Yeah, and so when Lightyear was announced, I was like, oh, they're going to remake the show. That's so sick. And then it came out that, oh no, this is not about Buzz Lightyear, the toy. This is about the what the toy was based on. Inspired by, yeah. Yeah, like, I think what Angus McLean, the director, said was, and this pops up in the initial credits of the movie, of, this is the movie Andy would have seen in 1995 which i highly question they had the animation quality of of, well, of it, this in 1995 it, it would be very complicated yeah people always use that quote to to criticize the film because like I, like we said i thought it was fine but it's not very exciting for a kid i think it's no. it's about his regrets and, and the way he becomes obsessed with something but that obsession ends up losing him his friends and family and stuff and i, I was like 
these are like really depressing themes for a family film. I'm like, okay, yeah. that's fine. But I understand completely why a little kid wouldn't be excited for this film because it's it's like, yeah, he loses all his loved ones like in the first 15 minutes. It's okay. That's not very family friendly. It's it's weird. It's a weird film. And like I said, I thought it was fine, but it's not very conventional. Yeah. And I definitely think it was, it didn't know its audience because for me, who knew all like the background stuff of what Star Command was, I was like, oh, he said the thing from that show. And my parents had absolutely no idea what I was talking about. I don't think <laughs> like when he was giving his mission log, I was like, hey, he's doing the mission log. But mm-hmm. but it's much more of a like a tale of PTSD. Basically. And yeah. I don't think kids want to see that. <laughs> no, not particularly. Yeah. And even like, the tone, it's not very, it doesn't have a fun tone. It's a little bit dark at times and nothing like, because some Pixar films can be a little bit dark, but it was, this one was like very subdued. So it's mm-hmm. not very, I don't know. It, I know we're saying it's fine, but the, the more I describe it, the worse it sounds. So I don't know. <laughs> but yeah, it, it, I definitely was not, I, I think I want a different light year than, yeah. I, I definitely appreciate for it for what it was yeah but i'm still of the mind of hey lightyear can you just be that buzz lightyear of star command remake because it there's so many references to it in the in lightyear like so many if you know what you're looking for at least but yeah and compared to elemental i think getting off the toy story train and back onto the (laughs) elemental train I think this is one where I think it, it does benefit for maybe kids are coming back in school or just about to in summer vacation and they're like, oh, hey, what's the latest Pixar movie or what's the latest animated kids movie that we can see at the movies? And I think maybe that can contribute to their box office. And hopefully, I hope we see... Peter Stone do a lot more work like this because it's very smart. And yeah, definitely. And I think he deserves it because in the end he got a little bit redeemed. Everybody at the beginning was saying, oh, it's gonna get flop, it's not working, people are not seeing it. But they weren't seeing the big picture. They didn't thought they didn't think, sorry, on the long run. And in the end, he didn't do that bad. He did pretty well, actually. So I think in the end he got redeemed, especially in the eyes of people who were like saying it's a flop after one day, after the first day he was playing in theaters, which was a little bit absurd. And yeah, I would love seeing more stuff from him, definitely. Yeah, he has a very interesting and like you were saying, smart, creative eye, I think. Yeah, even if, yeah, whatever he does, just put a blank check on the table and slide it. Yeah, um, exactly. Especially for, I don't know what version of, oh, is it Render Man? Is that what they're using for, for the animation? Uh, I guess so, yeah. It's proprietary. They have their own stuff, so yeah. Yeah, whatever they're using. Because that fluid simulation and fire simulation looks oh, so yeah. good. Oh, yeah. Like, y'all don't even know how hard that is to achieve. There's a scene where, like, Wade's, like, stretching and, like, contorting, and his belly is bouncing, and I'm like, oh, that <laughs> must have taken, that render must have taken three days. Yeah, no, and the, and the fact that both your main characters are made of fire and water simulations, that's really ambitious. I mean, you can actually see even like in live action blockbusters that have much worse simulations and they're access, as expensive or even more expensive. So yeah, it's not easy at all. You, you can tell why it had to be such an expensive film. And and, and, I, and I'm, I'm happy that it did well in the end because, yeah, it was a, little, a lot of effort and time. <laughs> and And I also hope it's like a into the Spider-Verse moment for Mm. the animation industry where... Yeah. Because, and for those who don't know what I mean, after Into the Spider-Verse got the animated feature Oscar, everyone started aping that that style. Puss in Boots did it for The Last Wish. uh, Yeah. And DreamWorks is doing a ton of it. Um, Yeah, they did it with the bad guys. They did it with the Mitchells vs. the Machines, with the new Ninja Turtles, which I liked a lot. Um, I, so I need yeah, to see that tomorrow. Oh, yeah, please do. And let me know what you think, because it's I enjoyed it a bit, a lot. I wasn't expecting much because the Ninja Turtles franchise can be a little bit hit or miss. 
but this one was really good. Yeah, it's fun and it's it can be really clever, which is nice to see in a film like that. Yeah, what I think they what I hope that the animation industry learns from this movie is that you can do a bit of both with mm. animation. You sure you can make really expensive animations, but you can also really just hone in on hey, the objective doesn't matter. Where where the story ends up only matters when you care about the characters. Yeah, exactly. And I hope, especially with not casting huge stars for for the, these lead roles, I hope that someone like DreamWorks or Netflix or whoever just really get, goes out there and maybe looks at somebody who's coming up. Yeah, so basically what I was getting at is, you know, we can have, you can have that big budget or whatever, but I'd really love to see the animation industry learn and say, hey, let's get these actors and develop the roles with them and yeah. maybe work with them to develop the character or something. Because I think it really works here because I know Pixar talked at length about how Leah and Mamadou crafted these characters alongside Pixar. Yeah, no, and, and I think it's it's becoming more common. You you haven't seen it seen it yet, but for example, in, in in the case of Ninja Turtles, what they did was they recorded most of the of the lines with the four kid actors in the same room, so they could interact more realistically and they could improv and stuff like that. And it shows they do behave and they do talk like actual teenagers, and it feels great. It, it's really fun, and it and it avoids that cringy, how do you do fellow kids kind of dialogue or interaction because they're the ones who are creating the characters and giving them voices, which is, it works. It works perfectly. So yeah, I completely agree. That's, I think that's the route they have to take in order to have more original stuff and more creatively rewarding stuff, basically. Yeah, and with that, what do you think? I know it's way too early. We're only in September. <laughs> I, I say that like it's early in the award season parlance, but do we think Pixar has a shot for animated feature? I think they will definitely get nominated because they pretty much always do. But I think competition is a little bit strong this year. I thought Ninja Turtles was great. We have this one. I'm sure there's more animated films coming. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So yeah, I think definitely nominated. They might win, but we'll see what happens with the rest of during the rest of the year. And I know Ninja Turtles is a long shot, but I really enjoyed that one too. And the visual style is so original and so well made that it may have a shot. Maybe I don't know. We'll see. Yeah, we'll see. I, I hope something. And maybe this is just my cynical side, but <laughs> I every year I'm always hopeful that Disney does not win. <laughs> yeah, because they're the big one. They're the corporation. It's good too. To be behind the underdog and the more the smaller films that makes sense. And I get, <laughs> I I, I kind of hope, and I hope Spider Verse doesn't win. Oh really? Because I don't want to see repeats this year. I don't want to see a a repeat of any past things because That's Disney has won. Yeah, Disney has won so many Oscars for animated feature, and I also feel like the animation industry would get a wrong idea especially with Across the Spider-Verse, with how that ended, they'd get the wrong lesson from how that did. Yeah, that's a good point, so, because I love that film, but after reports of crunch times and abuse and the, the way like animators were treated in that film, yeah, it would teach them the wrong lesson, definitely. <laughs> oh, I was just talking about how the movie ended, but that too. Oh, yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, it's too, yeah. I, I guess I won't just say how the movie ended, because it's a part two film. So yeah, I, I, it has I think an open might, ending. Yeah, because I think it it would teach people maybe that oh hey we can make two movies out of one, and we've been through that cycle before. It doesn't work. Yeah, no, it Deathly Hollows really did not need to be two two movies. Yeah, uh, yeah, I think nobody will disagree with that. Let's give our final thoughts on the movie. Yeah, you go first. If you oh, want. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Final thoughts. I thought it was really enjoyable. I think the animation was beautiful. I think the themes it touches are really good. I like the characterizations of the protagonists. I do think it, it loses a little, a little bit of, because of it's not particularly original. It does remind you of other films, like the ones you mentioned, Utopia and, and other stuff. But I think it, 
it works because of its emotional honesty and the fact that I think a lot of people will manage to connect with the story. And in the end, even though the world building is solid and everything, I think that's the more valuable aspect of the film, basically. So yeah, obviously it would be better if you saw it in, in the cinema, but if you didn't manage to do it, it's totally fine if you see it at home because it's worth it. Yeah. yeah and maybe if you've got the extra dough, just spend the $800 or whatever rent out of the theater just for you yourself and, <laughs> and watch it while Taylor Swift airs tours next door or whatever. Exactly. Uh, might actually be a good soundtrack but yeah my i your thoughts echo my thoughts and i was surprised at how well it connected with me because i was thinking okay i know this is a story an allegory about the the current a second generation immigrant yeah and i thought okay this isn't going to connect with me but then it it did at every single point because of how it does it how it tr- tries to get you to see those experiences through the lens of these two characters, Wade and Ember. And I'm still surprised. I remember their names. I could not do that with Turning Red or, oh gosh. Luca has the advantage of them. Yeah, Luca yeah. especially. You remember um, Luca, but maybe no yeah. one else. <laughs> yeah, there's the girl with the ginger hair. I, I That's all I remember. Um, yeah. But, and not to say I don't like those films. I just think this is instantly more memorable yeah. for that. And I do wish I had seen it in theaters because I, you know, I watch a lot of my movies either on my 1080p monitor or my 1080p TV. It is rare that I break out the 4K TV. I think the only time recently I've done that is was for Avatar 2's home release. I mean, um, that's cool. yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that was like reference quality. It looked like how it did in the theater. Yeah, no, insane. that, that, that like, release is, is amazing, yeah. But yeah, my thoughts are your thoughts. I, I think it's like an easy 3.5, 4 out of 5, some, somewhere Yeah, I think I gave range. it a 4 back, in the, back when I saw it in the cinema. So yeah, a 4 out of 5 sounds good, yeah. The only knock I have against it is that it, the unoriginality mm-hmm. of how it gets there and then this is a small thing, and it's not a knock against the film. But I would have appreciated this. I would have appreciated if this film was IMAX too, because oh. I feel like this really, especially with the whatever sky shot, the o- overview shot of Elemental City, I was like, that would have been really fantastic in IMAX. Definitely. Uh, because Lightyear does do IMAX very well for what it is. So I was hoping to see it there, and I couldn't remember if this was an IMAX or not. But Pixar, if you're listening, I doubt you are. Please <laughs> just make more of your movies in IMAX. It would be great. And also, it, I, I know you hate hearing this, Pixar, but it would also be a selling point for when your movie comes to Disney+. Plus. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Especially because they, they spend so much on technology and new animation styles and, and techniques and everything. It's like if you're going to spend so much time and money and effort on the visual side of the film, just show it in IMAX. It makes total sense. So, yeah. Yeah, and I'm just a cinematography geek. So, like, any... And I have a true IMAX in my local whatever theater I have. It's 70 feet tall almost. Nice. Not Yeah, 70 feet tall. Six. It's I think the actual figure is more like 68 feet tall, but close enough. We can round <laughs> up there. It's It's past the five. But... So seeing Oppenheimer like that was amazing. So it, Pixar, if you want to make an IMAX version someday, I wouldn't say no. Yeah, exactly. But yeah, I think that about does it for this episode of the podcast. What do you got coming up? I'm, what are you going to see? The last, funnily enough, the last film I saw at the cinema was a couple of nights ago, the film Strays. The that that root comedy about the talking dogs, which was I thought it had a lot of potential, but it was just like okay, like it was more rude than actually funny. But it was okay. different, so whatever. And <laughs> and then I think the next releases are like what the new Exorcist film, which looks suitably scary. And yeah, I pretty much I try to go to the cinema pretty much every week. Oh, actually tonight I'm seeing the the new Pedro Almodovar film, the one with Pedro Pascal and Ethan Hawke. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I'm seeing it tonight. So nice. that should be fun. It's half an hour long. It's pretty short, but I'm excited about that. So that might be my next review. Yeah. Yeah, I'm really hoping to see that. I've been talking with Sony about that. I'm like, please, 
I, I don't care where I gotta go. I will sit there for 30 minutes. Yeah, it's not, it's not a lot, so yeah. But yeah, I, I, from what I've seen, you have a, a lot of pending episodes, so I'm sure we'll, we'll see each other again in the, in the show. Yeah, tomorrow I've got Cocaine Bear with Emmanuel. And I know that sounds weird to a lot of people, and I'm sure it felt weird for a lot of people when I said I was going to be talking about Elemental in September. But I'm also trying to go back and really talk about movies I hadn't talked about yet that I may have yeah. seen earlier in the early in the year. But the main reason is, I guess, Cocaine Bears getting a Blu-ray release. Oh, I, again, I don't. I was on huh. Blu-ray.com and saw it was getting a Blu-ray release tomorrow. Nice. Along with a bunch of other Universal films. So I guess they're maybe re-releasing it for the October crowd. But yeah, I've got that with Emmanuel. I've got the director of something you said last night on tomorrow mm -hmm. on Wednesday. Nice. And yeah, that's that's it for video stuff. But I'm probably going to have reviews of El Conde Elemental, obviously. What else? What else is this week? I don't think I have anything else this week. But it's good. <laughs> and I'm sure I'm missing something, but I'll have the link to your socials in the podcast notes. I'll also Thank have you. the link to my schedule because I guess if I just want to do this real quick, I'll just do the little Patreon thing. But before we leave, I want to thank my patrons and Brian Scuttle, Joseph Davis, whose work you can find on Syspop, Matthew Simpson, someone we both know of Awesome yeah. Friday, and Tom Blackburn, who gave me the idea to interview people and, and talk about movies instead of just me talking to a the, my webcam so yeah if you want to become a patron get my weekly schedule and things like that head on over to patreon.com slash austin b media or austin b media slash support for information but with that thank all of you for listening or watching if you're doing this on youtube or spotify or wherever the video platforms i, I still don't know where you can do that <laughs> i'd recommend doing spotify though because on spotify patreon unlocked the they did a spotify patreon integration where mm -hmm. you can subscribe to my Patreon by clicking the Patreon feed in my main show. Right? So that gets you like one day early access to this podcast. And other than that, if you enjoyed this uh, episode, please subscribe and leave a rating on your, or review on your favorite podcast app. You can follow me on social media at Austin B Media everywhere except Twitter because Twitter support apparently won't let me have that. Sebastian, where can people find you? Oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, mainly I mainly <laughs> write in Spanish, which if you didn't know already, that's something. I have my Rotten Tomatoes profile, so you can find me there in Zavala. There you can find most of my reviews. I've done a couple of, of reviews in English, which you should be able to find. I think the last one was the one, because I was fortunately enough to, I was living in London during the lockdown. So I was fortunately enough to watch Tenet in IMAX back in 2020. Everybody was maxed, maxed up and everything was weird. But it was amazing. So I, I actually wrote in English about that film, which was interesting. And yeah, you can find me on Instagram as Sebasaba underscore Cine, which is S-E-B-A underscore, no, sorry, S-E-B-A Z-A-V-A underscore C-I-N-E. Like uh, Austin said, he's going to include my socials in the, in the show notes. And yeah, thanks very much for having me. This was so much fun. It was really cool to, to talk about this film after a while. And I hope we see each other again and I hope people enjoyed this episode. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I really hope people did. And if you uh, want more, I I talked with Anne, like I talked about at the beginning of this podcast, about El Conde. So that okay. should be out by the time this is public and should already be out by as I'm talking. I'll see you next time. Definitely. Thank you. Take care.